Um, welcome everyone to the seventh edition of Craftsbury's Wednesday webinar series. Um, our host this week is Will Ruth, uh, known to many of you already as Strength Coach Will, author of Rowing Stronger Strength Training to Maximize Rowing Performance. Um, Will's going to talk to us today about strength training priorities for scholars and rowers. Uh, training for improved technique and longevity in the sport. Um, in, a, in a not too long ago uh, incarnation, Will was the assistant coach and strength coach at Western Washington University. And he and his wife, uh, fortunately for us, moved to Vermont uh, two summers ago, I want to say. Will can tell you when, when I turn it over to him. But in any event, um, I don't want to belabor the introduction without further belaboring. Here's Will Ruth. All right, great, thanks, Troy. Uh, yeah, it was actually last last summer was my first summer there. Uh, we made the move in April, um, and so I was hoping for this to be my second official Craftsbury season. But we will settle for the webinar life instead. Thanks everybody for joining us for strength training for scholars. I'm gonna get right into my material. What I have here is basically a, a discussion of what the what the performance differences are in between from sculling, sweeping, and uh, erging. So no doubt many of you are familiar with the general principles, but what I want to do here is go specifically into uh, the, the specifics of strength training for sculling. All right. And so again, discussing what the physical performance differences are between sculling um, and, and erging and rowing and or erging and sweeping, as well as for different race distances, because sculling can be encompassing of uh, many different things. So then the other thing that I'll do with this webinar is talk about how to make your own strength training adjustments uh, for sculling and your different goals. So whether that's technique, uh, longevity in the sport, um, and then and then sprint or uh, distance race performance, if that is relevant to you. I've got a couple of assumptions of this webinar just to get out of the way before we get going. Uh, with only about an hour of content, I could not cover everything that there is to know about strength training for rowing. So I'm really focusing this on just what the performance differences are with sculling and how we can use our strength training time to train for those specific performance differences and the specific characteristics of sculling. So a couple of assumptions are that you're currently doing some sort of strength training or you have experience uh, and access to some equipment. I know that right now with the various uh, shutdown and reopening situations, that that's not a given for everybody. Um, if you're training with you know total body weight, then that is uh, not exactly a performance situation. Um, so if we have time in the Q and A, I can take questions about how to make that work. But for the purpose of the webinar, I'm going to assume that you're you're doing strength training, have access to equipment, um, and, and or have some experience in it. Um, and then I'm also assuming that you're primarily strength training to improve your sculling abilities. So that could be just your technique uh, and ability as a sculler, or it could be your performance uh, in, in a specific race context. Um, where I where I struggle is when the goals are so broad and all encompassing that okay we're talking about strength training for sculling here but uh, now I want to talk about how to increase my bench press and those are those are different goals and as a strength coach of rowers I focus on what are the performance characteristics of rowing and how can we use strength training to train for those characteristics and then on the health side um, I am assuming that you are currently healthy or you at least know your limits if you're a master's rower perhaps you do have have some uh, pre-existing injuries that you at least know know how to work around and work with. Um, I'm a strength coach, not a physical therapist, so I'll say this again before the Q and A gets going. But um, I am neither qualified nor insured to be talking about or providing advice about specific injuries or ailments. Um, and then finally, the material that I'm going to present here is general. Um, it can't be individually prescriptive, and I'm not seeking to cure any injuries or ailments. So I'll talk about general movement dysfunctions and how we can use strength training to improve those. But when it comes to specific injuries or, or very individual considerations, uh, that is the role of a physical therapist. So with that out of the way, I want to talk about these three different kinds of rowing. And so I've got three different pictures here of our three different athletes. Uh, just from the side here, what I am looking at mostly is the lower body. And at the lower body level, 
from the hips down, these three are very similar movements. This is not so when we go to part two and we look at it from the front. So here is our erger, and here is our sweeper, and here is our sculler. And those are three very, very different actions around the shoulders and around the rib cage and different training uh, systems and, and methods and exercises are needed to be able to get the most out of each of these specific performance characteristics. So when it comes to understanding what we're going to do with strength training for sculling, we need to start with understanding of what sculling is. And that means basically doing a needs analysis or understanding what the specific performance demands are. Um, and I I've, have flown this picture up in front of a bunch of different people and gotten some very different reactions as far as, uh, you know, oh, wow, I didn't realize these were that different. Because on the erging, we see that it's a very straightforward reach. Uh, our, our green racing project scholar here is doing a good Craftsbury hug the horizon position. Um, and, then, and then our sweep rower is doing something entirely different with a rotational element that we don't have in any of the other disciplines. So in our needs analysis, we can look at our, our performance characteristics. Uh, Fitness-wise, we need more of an aerobic system performance for at least uh, two kilometer plus performance, as well as for recovery in between training sessions. A functioning aerobic system, heart and lungs, uh, is highly important for your ability to, to perform and recover in training. Uh, we need then more anaerobic fitness if we're going to race for less than 2,000 meters uh, or in, in 2km races if we're doing uh, like the sprint and the start is critical for our, for our anaerobic system performance. And the key performance indicator for strength is so that the race pace is sub-maximal. And there's been various research done on like where exactly that threshold is. Uh, but what I've seen is that it's typically around 60% of your max watts is is your 2k pace so if you're trying to do your 2k pace at more than 60 percent of your max watts it's going to be very very fatiguing and we'll get more benefit from increasing your max watts so that your sub max pace can come up rather than going the other way around and really trying to do a ton of sub max building so that's where strength training can come in is building that peak force capacity so that then all of the rowing erging and cross training all builds the the sub maximal uh, more endurance floor and the um, the the sort of key uh, equation for for the role of strength training in rowing is increasing strength to decrease your per stroke effort to then Im improve your sub max endurance and performance that's again the same idea that if if the weight of the stroke is a very high percentage of your max force it's going to be very tiring to do uh, uh, at, race at, pace. at race pace we also need great technique and that's boat dependent. So if you are a sculler who rows mostly quads, that's going to be a slightly different technique than if you're a sculler who rows mostly singles. So that's an important consideration to make uh, that we can talk a little bit more about later with what some of those specific performance characteristics are. But we're going to consider this on, on basically an individual approach for each, each athlete uh, that, that we're doing strength training with. And then finally, experience. If you want to be good at racing, you need racing experience. And it's just a certain amount of times to figure out what's going to work best for you um, in, in warm-ups, in preparation, in tapering and, and peaking, and in actual race strategy. And I don't think that that can be gained um, in any other way other than, other than time of racing uh, and time spent training and, and thinking about it. So these are the things that, you know, Great scholars are going to have all of these things in abundance. Um, the top performers in any sport have just the right combination, or typically have just the right combination of genetic variables, physiologically and biomechanically, um, as well as training experience uh, and and exposure uh, to the sport, um, and and then the actual the actual performance ability. So, I think that we can be good scholars with sort of a choose your own adventure approach of picking, picking which of these resonates more with you. If you are the technician um, and, and you want to achieve the, it's, it's the pursuit of excellent technique that's most motivating for you, um, then you'll be in this, in this category here of going for basically adequate strength and fitness, enough so that it's not holding you back and then spending your time on, on pursuing great technique. Uh, those inclined to towards drills um, and, and long meters in the boat, um, that might be the path for you. For other people, 
um, they're more on the physiological side of things. And so it's going to be adequate technique and a simple rigging system. That's the other thing too. Uh, you need in this ladder camp, you need to master the art of sculling and the dark art of rigging. Um, in, in the former camp, we'll go for adequate technique and a simple rig, uh, and then great strength and fitness. And that's where your edge is going to come from. And I think there's enough examples of good scholars, um, who are not excellent in both categories, but can still be good uh, by by maximizing one and achieving sort of adequacy in, in the other. Part of our needs analysis is going to be specific injury risks too. There's not a ton out there on the question of is sculling healthier or safer. Um, I know that that's a commonly held opinion among rowers and rowing coaches, but the limited research that exists is actually pretty inconclusive on that. So I, I did a quick scan. I'm, I'm a big fan of using academic research to inform uh, general principles. Let's get the, the best available resources and then figure out how to best apply them based on our experience as athletes and coaches and in our own individual situation. Uh, there's been some studies coming out of Team Australia recently, and one found more rib stress injuries in their sweep rowers uh, between 2013 and 2015. And then they found more rib stress injuries in their scholars in the 2016 year. So again, sort of inconclusive because it, it flipped on one and the other. There's one great study on competitive masters athletes that did a survey of uh, 700 athletes who were competing at the masters uh, world regatta. Um, and they did not find that there was a significant difference um, in injuries in the year of training leading up to the event between scholars and sweepers. And then in junior rowers, also inconclusive. This was a study of 398 uh, same same lead author here, um, same study design of, of a survey for rowers who have participated at a world championship event, um, and also inconclusive there. And then for rib stress injuries, uh, the Evans and Redgrave uh, Great Britain pathway document for rib stress injuries says that the risk is switching between sculling and sweeping, or going from sweeping to sculling, or switching sides and sweeping. It's not so much one individual uh, modality for, for rib stress injuries. And then for low back injuries, one thing that this competitive master's study found was that masters men, oh no, sorry, men, men and women over the age of 60 had more low back injuries with sculling uh, than they did with sweeping and that that didn't hold for any other categories. So um, again, it doesn't paint a clear picture, but I think that that's the key takeaway from this is that there isn't a clear argument that sculling is inherently uh, healthier or safer. And what rowing injury research comes back to time and time again is that rowing injuries occur as overuse injuries due to abrupt changes in training volume, alterations in technique, or the type of boat rowed. So especially for master's athletes who might be switching uh, between or for folks now who are suddenly into singles when they haven't been before, they just be aware that anytime we make a significant change in equipment, that there's, that there's a risk of injury. So even if you're making a, a, a change in rigging, um, that's that's more of a risk is that is that sudden change than it is any one particular individual variable. <clears throat> and then there are personal factors involved in our needs analysis too. So people can come to sculling from all different backgrounds, and it was really fun in my first year of Craftsbury last year, uh, getting to coach a wide range of people who had come to sculling from all sorts of different backgrounds. There were the former uh, collegiate or junior sweep rowers who would then come back to the sport. As, as adults, um, there were the folks who had picked up an oar for the very first time. Um, there were particularly the, the just pre-Title IX generation of women who were learning a whole new athletic identity uh, relatively later in life um, that they had never had access to before. Um, I think that has been one of the more fun demographics for me to coach. Um, and then with it, it could be youth rowers too. Sculling is generally more available than sweeping. Um, and then the other one that was interesting to me was uh, CrossFit. People crossing over from CrossFit, having been exposed to rowing via the ERG, they have a very high strength base compared to most rowers, but their aerobic endurance is relatively weak because they haven't done the amount of uh, miles and, and meters that, that other longer training rowers have done. Um, and then technique was much more of a factor for them. Um, and then there are, of course, athletes who cross over from other sports. So if you come to rowing from something like endurance cycling, part of our needs analysis is going to be your aerobic endurance is going to be very, very good, but it's possible that your full body coordination uh, in the rowing movement instead of the cycling movement, and if you're going to be racing 1Ks in, in the sprint format, um, 
your your anaerobic system is gonna is gonna need work. So we consider that in our needs analysis too. Um, and then finally, personal strengths, weaknesses, and injury history. Again, without without approaching the injury topic directly in a diagnosis capacity, I will take into account like what people have experienced generally and what we need to work around. Um, usually, that's going to be okay. I'm actively rehabbing this for, with a physical therapist, so we're going to work around it. Or hey, I know that that's that one thing as a lost cause, so we are going to just work around it entirely. And that's all. That's all part of the needs analysis. And then finally, I want to address too, uh, if you don't race, then your specific performance demands are different than if somebody is racing and training for a very specific uh, athletic feat. So if you don't race um, and you're training for technique and longevity, with especially here in, in 2020, we were trying to decide before if this is the year of the single sculler uh, or the year of the webinars, but we're going to do both in this anyway. So we, whichever one of those is fine. Uh, there are plenty of people who are sculling just for the sake of being able to get out on the water, uh, or pursue excellence themselves without the uh, extrinsic motivation of racing um, and, and longevity in the sport. So there's still strength training relevancy for that. You can just sort of pick and choose more of what you want to do because there isn't that trade-off of I'm trying to achieve this specific performance. Therefore, I sort of need to do these things that, that I know I need to do that I wouldn't necessarily choose to do myself. Um, there's, there's more, more of a trade-off there. So I will address, uh, sort of like the bare minimum approach. If you are still strength training and you're like, you know what, I just don't care about these things. I'm not in it for this performance, but I still want this from the, from the technical performance side. Uh, we'll talk about that more as we go. So from here, what I want to do is go, I've, I've got the bulk of my presentation set up to talk about specific exercises, um, and, and specific movement recommendations for scholars. I think that that's more where the utility of strength training is rather than the in-depth physiological side that's been pretty fairly well covered elsewhere. Um, what I do as a, as a dual strength coach and rowing coach is try to connect the physical learning that we can do in the gym uh, or in the non-gym, depending on what your personal recreation situation is right now, uh, with what the rowers are hearing on the water. And so there's two Rick Ricky quotes that I want to come to uh, from his prior webinars. Uh, one is that the skulls are extensions of the shoulder girdle. And if that's true, then the shoulder girdle must be very strong uh, because the skulls are made of carbon fiber. So I'm all for that. And and the next thing we're going to talk about um, is, is the pulling exercises so that we can build the short the shoulder girdle uh, with the intent of making it as strong as the carbon fiber. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to quote uh, was was the line that he used in the webinar about about thinking on land and then just rowing when you just row. And, and that ties directly into this because what we're going to do is use a lot of these movements to learn the physical lessons that we then want to be able to unclutter your mind of when you're actually out of the water. The last thing that I want to do on the water is tell an athlete that they really need to be activating their lower trapezius because there's just too much to think about uh, when you're out there training in a three-dimensional potentially chaotic performance capacity. However, the lower trapezius is what this next section is all about. So this is a video that I snagged from the Muscle and Motion YouTube channel that shows what happens when you raise your arm, um, which happens both when we're rowing as well as when we are training. Um, and you'll notice here that, that the shoulder blade itself is free floating, but it's very anchored by the muscles that we're gonna see in the next slide or in the next demonstration here is what actually happens at a muscular level when you do this simple motion. So that's what's going on under the hood. And on the on the central side by the spine or the lower trapezius, there's also the middle trapezius and the rhomboids that we're going to talk about. But it's really important that we learn how to train these muscles um, and, and activate those. You're welcome to try any of these as you go. The videos will all be available to you later too. But this is called the YWT raise. And basically we're making the letters Y, W, and T, similar to the song YMCA, but with different lyrics. Um, and the whole time we're thinking shoulder blades back and down, shoulders in the back pockets. So here I'm doing the W raise. And when I rolled this out in the, in the strength training workshops that I was able to do on a couple of weekends at Craftsbury, um, there was a, a widespread reaction of, of people learning about muscles that they never really felt before. We're doing the T's now. Um, and, and, the, and the big thing to think about here is that we're, we're going again, shoulder blades in the back pockets the whole time. I show in the next uh, clip some errors here. 
of what goes wrong with the YWTs. And what happens is people allow their their upper trapezius muscles on the on the top of the shoulders in between the neck to take over. And the shoulders go out of the back pockets and they come up and forward. So it's really helpful to sort of feel it wrong, roll them up and forward, just like I'm doing there, and then roll them back and down and, and try to feel those little muscles activating because that's what's that's what's ultimately going to get us into the hug the horizon position and have our shoulder girdles be as strong as our skulls it's the same thing there's errors on the w is the shoulders coming up and forward and i start with the pulling movements for a reason because we're going to continually refer back to the shoulder function on on all the other exercises too are all opportunities to learn how to tie the the shoulders in with the rest of the movement just the way that we need to when we're on the water so again, this is bad as shoulders up and forward, good as shoulders back and down. Once we get that down, we can go into more of the, of the building exercises. This is the band pull apart. We're again gonna be keeping the shoulders back and down the whole time. And I'll show on a couple of these just while we get going on like the wrong of, of the shoulders coming up and forward. So you can see there that it's not, the arm is not leading the shoulder, the shoulder is leading the arm. So I cue people to do it wrong, shrug them up, and then pack them down and feel it correct. The face pull is another exercise that we could do, and you could do these with a band or a cable, by the way. But now we're getting the external rotation component of the shoulder into, in a way that we can't when we, when we skull. So this is one area where, where in some degrees, we're training the same movement, and in other ways, we're training a different element of the movement, too. Uh, the X-band row is one of my favorites for teaching the, the tight shoulder position at the, at the release and the draw through to end the water cycle. Uh, we can get to the same positions as we can when, when sculling uh, just from the, from the X-band row. So the same thing. Errors occur when the shoulder creates the movement from the upper traps instead of maintaining the shoulder position while drawing the arm through. Some athletes will also arch here and start contributing with, with lumbar movement, which is also not ideal. This is one of my favorites. Uh, you can do this on a, on a, with bands or cables. It gets into the more of the unilateral demand, but we're we're still training the stability of the hand that's not moving at the time. So this is the alternating row. Um, you pull in with one, and then and then while letting the other go. So we could train a slightly different movement while still training the same general characteristics. The one arm row here. Um, I wanted to show this because one of the things that I hear often from rowers and especially masters uh, is that the one arm row in the typical fashion where you're standing beside the bench can aggravate the back from the twisting motion. So if you straddle the bench uh, like I am there, then we can get the straight forward. Eric, I'm sorry, do you mind going back and replaying that one real quick? Such a thing as possible. <clears throat> Uh, so there we've got we've got a straightforward pulling action now instead of with that twisting of the back at the bottom of the movement. So I just wanted to show that again. This is not a comprehensive list of all exercises, but just some general movements that I like um, and, and the cues that I'll use for training them with with scholars. The band pull down uh, is going to be the same shoulder movement, but just with um, and thanks, Eric, if you could replay that. Sorry. Um, just a in a slightly different movement plane. So instead of in the horizontal movement plane, we're gonna go into the vertical plane. I much prefer using the band pull down with more rowers uh, because I find that often the strength is not there for chin-ups. And what happens is what I'm gonna show next on the errors where the shoulder gets pulled up and forward the same way that we have errors on the horizontal pull, pulling movements. Um, and, then, and then the upper trapezius are taking over. So. You can see that I'm way shrugged up there. My shoulders are not in my back pockets. So through this whole progression, we've built up from understanding the basic physical movements. And there's, I'm just demonstrating shoulders up and forward versus shoulders back and down. Um, building up from the basic physical movements into more of the uh, overall strength training. So for athletes who are stronger and can do pull-ups while maintaining those good physical positions, uh, that, that may be an option, but, but for most rowers, I find it better suited to use a, to use a pull down exercise, um, instead of a chin up exercise. So the 
pushing movements are just pulls in reverse. And I know that sounds like an obvious statement, uh, but where the shoulder's concerned, we want to attend to all of the same uh, shoulder positioning movements in pushing that we did in pulling. It's all the same fundamentals as far as how the shoulder blade is going to move while being anchored and, and having motion created by the muscles that are involved. So I like to start with the push-up because this is a basic um, open chain exercise, which is to say that, that the, the shoulders are, are free moving instead of on the bench where they're pinned into place. So hopefully you can see with the knowledge from the pulling exercises that this is essentially the same motion happening just in reverse with the shoulder staying back and down and the arm moving around the shoulder, not the shoulder moving the arm. So errors happen when athletes allow the shoulder to move first with the shrug up and now the arms following the shoulder instead of the other way around. So these are all generalizable athletic traits uh, that we can then apply to sculling too while also building up the muscles. Here I'm just demonstrating another, another common error of just letting the torso connection go. And I found it much more valuable rather than having athletes do, say, a, a kneeling push-up or just struggling through sets of very low reps, to use higher reps but from an elevated position. So what I'm showing in this video um, is just using a, a plyo box. You can use a bench. You can use a stairway if you've got stairs of good height. And this is all the same motion but just it, with the lifter in a position of mechanical advantage. So what, what I'll do here is build the athlete up uh, from this point and then slowly lower their height while attempting to keep the reps very similar. Um, and I, I tell one story about this all the time that uh, I was coaching a, a junior camp and was doing a strength training component. And I asked the athletes beforehand what they wanted to learn. Um, and this is what one young woman, I think she was maybe a sophomore. Um, and, and very new, very new physical training. And she said, well, I want to learn how to do a push up because my coach always says my push up technique sucks. And I said, well, okay, let's see, let's see what we're dealing with first. And so she showed me her push up and, you know, she could only go about halfway down to the floor and her elbows were way flared out. Shoulders were shrugged up. And rather than talk about technique, I just put her up on this plyo box and said, well, let's see it now. And she had essentially a, a, a perfect push up. We made some small adjustments, but it was not like your push up sucks level of technical recreation. So, in that case, it really wasn't a technical problem, it was a strength problem. And so, I think choosing appropriate exercises for the athlete's uh, level is a, is a particularly crucial part of, of, again, our needs analysis, thinking back to like where, where, what the athlete's experience is um, in all forms of training, rowing as well as strength training. Uh, once the elevated push-up, one, one in-between stage in-between elevated push-ups and, and full push-ups from the floor, our ladder push-ups, where we'll start from the most challenging position from the floor, do reps there, and then go into an intermediate position. So there we go up to one slightly higher height. and then up to our, our top height. So we could do this with, uh, with more reps. I'm just demonstrating the different stages. Uh, but if you're at that sort of in-between point where you can't quite do many reps of push-ups from the floor, do as many as you can from the floor with, with good technique, go up to the next level, give yourself some mechanical advantage, get some more reps in, and then go to the final stage and get some more reps in and, and count that as one set. I've basically done one set of, of nine or 10 reps here uh, in, in the ladder style. So then once the athlete is, is pretty proficient at push-ups, uh, when I was coaching the college team, I like to see the, the college male rowers be able to do 30 good push-ups before we started adding load uh, with any sort of barbell or dumbbell variations. One that I particularly like for scholars, similar to the alternating uh, band row that we saw in the last video, is the alternating dumbbell press. Because here we're training shoulder stability on one hand while we train the pushing motion on the other hand. And so this is all, again, seeking to tie that, that shoulder stability in with the rest of, of the full body system. So just one, one idea there. I, want, I wanted to put some different exercises in here that you may have not been exposed to before and provide some of the sculling rationale for that too. 
Uh, the half-kneeling overhead press was one that Marlene Royal covered in her webinar last week. Um, I fully agree with her on the utility of this because we could see the same motion as in the pull-down was the vertical plane. Here we're doing the half-kneeling press in the vertical plane with all the same lessons as what we learned in the horizontal plane as far as the arm leading the shoulder, not the other way around. So here are some errors of this exercise where the shoulder starts leading the arm and we see the shoulder kick up and then the arm move. So if we can get the athlete to generalize this and develop basic strength in the shoulder stabilizers, what I've found is that these lessons are much easier to learn in the dynamic three-dimensional environment of, of on-water rowing. So here I'm getting some more torso kick and here with the half kneeling overhead press really allows us to do is focus, uh, get the glute bracing in and just focus on the uh, shoulder movement. We can then move up to the one arm push press. And I, like, I particularly like this exercise for rowers because again, we're tying in the shoulder stability with, with the rest of the system. So we've got transfer, we've got force transfer happening from the foot plate through a tight torso to an implement held in the hands. Very similar to rowing where we're transferring force from the foot plate through the tight torso to the handle. Some common errors happen with this. Uh, where athletes start to dip forward into it instead of instead of maintaining a nice upright position. They try to get more force from the legs. This also happens if people just are simply going too heavy. So that's just something to be aware of there. Let's go next into our squatting movements. I'm happy to... Uh, I will pause at the at the end of the of the movement demo section and take any any questions that have come up in between. Um, again, assuming that you're able to do a body weight squat, the next level of, of progression is the goblet squat. We're going to hold either a dumbbell or a kettlebell and do our squat. So what we're looking for here is balanced pressure between the forefoot and the hind foot, not slanting way forward or sort of falling over backward. And this is going to be just the basis of our of our strength training to build up the anterior lower body. Here I'm just demonstrating the same movement, but done with a kettlebell, just in case anybody had a hard time imagining it. There are a couple of common, uh, what I call like the rower squat of just either restricted range of motion just due to lack of mobility in the hips or the kind of typical drive sequencing that I'm showing here of like the legs extend and then the torso catches up. So I'll show it correct again here that we want everything to be to be going down and rising up together. And that's how we can start to build the, the, the quads, the legs to produce the force instead of just putting it onto the back as in, as in this exercise. So typically rowers who do tend to put a lot of pressure on their back when they're rowing, I find that they do often the same thing in the, in, in the gym. And so they were not actually getting much better, we're just making the problem worse. Once we've either exceeded uh, the loading ability of dumbbells and kettlebells, or when the athlete's ready for a challenge, we can go to the barbell front squat. This is all basically the same movement. I much prefer the front squat to the back squat because the rower can cheat less. Um, this also requires the same shoulder stability as in all of our previous exercises. The pulling exercises, all of the scapular muscles are working to stabilize this. In this one, I'm demonstrating the, the, the clean grip. We can also do it with the cross grip. Um, I find that that Scullers often have just sore forearms from the amount of, of sculling time um, that, that they typically do. And so the cross grip can, can just take some pressure off of the, off of the wrist and off the forearms. Um, and then here what I'm showing is that our, our movement is the same between the, between the dumbbell uh, goblet squat and between the front squat. Ideally, these are very similar movements, just with a difference in position of where the bar is located. So uh, dumbbell, dumbbell, goblet squat being a, a prerequisite for going into the barbell front squat. Sometimes, especially with uh, master's athletes with sore knees, uh, doing fully loaded squats is just not happening. Um, or juniors with very tight hips is the, is the other side of the equation. So I will restrict the range of motion while we work on the hip mobility to get into a full depth squat. If we're going to produce good force from a position of full compression in rowing, I really believe that we need to be able to get down to parallel in a squat as well. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we're getting further than that uh, 
compression um, in, in, in a boat or on an ERG. So rather than use a, a box or something to sit down to, I found it much more effective to, to restrict range of motion with a band. So it just is a signal for the athlete for when to come back up. It's not actually taking any support uh, from the athlete. It's not offering any aid to the athlete other than just marking where that point is. The other thing that I really work a lot with rowers is single leg exercises. Um, while, while the sculling motion is roughly bilateral in terms of both legs, both limbs acting at the same time, there are plenty of differences between the two uh, and the number of people who we've fished out of the shore uh, at, at, at Craft Ferry su su summer camps or potentially people on this webinar who've been fit, fished out of the traffic pattern uh, can attest to the fact that the legs do not always evenly push uh, exactly together. So single leg exercises are a way that we can correct some of those uh, imbalances and make sure that we're not developing further imbalances in our other training. So this is my general progression of single leg exercises. First, the reverse lunge. I find this is really critical for teaching balance too and training balance, something that's, that, that, that can be quickly lost when, when we're in the seated position in rowing is balance on one leg. The other thing that I find that rowers do a lot uh, is is trying to do pistol squats or full single leg squats that that don't actually have the hip stability components that we want to train. So here I'm going to demonstrate uh, a very conservative, though still challenging form of single leg squat that I really encourage everybody to try. There's three different directions to this movement. The first is just forwards. And what I'm trying to do is just skim my heel very lightly here, putting no pressure on it but while still keeping my hips very even. So my left leg is working now, but both sides of my hip joint are stabilizing that, that movement. And I found this to be really, really productive for especially single scholars who are responsible for their own balance. Same thing, that now we're getting into the lateral movement where we don't get at all when rowing. And it's not about getting a ton of range of motion in because this is pretty challenging from a hip stability component. And then the final one is, is backwards. And so here I'm just trying to skim the toe. You see sometimes my balance is perfect. I have to rely a little bit more on the toe. But I found these to be much more productive than doing a pistol squat that sort of just drops down to the bottom with no real uh, muscular control. Or it's just a test of, of knee uh, tendon strength of how much we can rebound um, in a way that we really don't get when, when we're actually on the water. Uh, then we can go to the rear foot elevated split squat. This is a more muscularly challenging exercise, but a little bit less on the balancing requirements. Here I've just got the rear foot elevated, just like the name suggests. Front leg is the one doing the work. Here we're getting nice deep range of motion and also an active stretch on the back leg hip flexor. We can also load it. Here I'm doing the contralateral load, which means that uh, opposite hand, opposite leg. So now we're building in some cross body stability too, in a way that I find really productive for uh, scholars. That's one of those things that is just sort of use it or lose it. And if we don't, if we don't actively use this single leg balance, uh, then I find that it is quickly lost. We can also load it with a with the goblet squat form too. Here we're doing a little bit more of a muscular focus on the leg and a little bit less of a hip stability focus. So again, I'm just rolling through these again. You'll have access to all these videos uh, via, the, via the supplemental materials available after the presentation. The lateral step up is another exercise that I particularly like uh, for, a, for a continuation. It's a little bit more range of motion than the earlier lateral single leg exercise. But same thing here. I'm not trying to do a ton of range of motion. I'm just trying to really work the hip stability, a soft, soft touch with the heel of that down leg. And I show some errors on that afterwards too. We can do the step ups from the front as well. Here we've got a little bit less of the lateral stability demands, a little bit more of the muscular emphasis on the quads. And the nice thing is that we can really adjust the height to be customizable for the athlete. So where's the point at which you can still maintain good hip stability while working the, the up leg? If we're not training with hip stability, then I'm not sure what we're actually achieving in terms of what we think we're going to transfer onto the water. So here are some errors in terms of just hip flop. Um, here I'm not maintaining any hip tightness. I'm really pushing off the bottom leg. Here I'm just cheating and using rebound. 
And so I find that it's been much more productive to use a lower step height with more hip stability work, both for the balance side as well as for um, the, the muscular development side. And then what I really commonly see, especially with junior and collegiate programs, um, is just use of way too challenging of a box. So this is going to be very muscularly challenging on that front leg, but it's also going to be very challenging to our spinal health um, and, and long-term well-being because I'm in such this rounded over position at the bottom here. It's not. This is not where we want to be producing rowing performance from. Uh, nor is it what we want to be continually exposing our spines to. So I find it much more effective to use one of the lower height single leg exercises uh, than, than to try to go to the, the full height without being able to adequately control hip stability. <clears throat> our next uh, major movement category is the hinge movements. This is another one that I was teaching at the weekend workshops last year and, and finding a lot of benefit from with rowers of just working on the hip hinge. It's the in-between point in between a, a squat down and a bend forward. So here I've got an, an athletic unlock of the knees and then my hips moving backwards. I find that particularly rowers who come to rowing with, um, with no other athletic background are, are often very unfamiliar with this hinge pattern. If you've played other sports, it's the breakdown position in basketball. It's the serve return in tennis. It's the uh, receiving a ground ball in baseball. But if you don't have that diverse athletic background, then you know where, where would you have learned that otherwise? So that's what strength training has an opportunity to teach. If, if people struggle with it, just the body weight version, like I showed, this is, the, this is the target to a wall or target to a power rack. If people just squat down here, their butt's never gonna, actually going to get back to the wall. And if they just bend forward, same thing. So providing the little tangible target just says that the hips have to move back this way, not just bending forward. And then my, not my last resort, because I'll, I'll often use it first, but one of the clearest ways to teach the hip hinge is to use the PVC pipe with three points of contact, uh, one at sort of the high hip glute area, one at the mid back, and then one at the head, and then do this same movement. And I'll, on this one, I show errors of like what happens when you lose one of those points of contact. That's when the hip hinge is just broken down. So some segment is moving out of order. Here we're doing correctly. Now we're starting to lose our contacts, right? So having just a little bit of a, of a mechanical, tangible aid can help keep the exercise or, or help, help, help keep the movement cued in. So this is basically the, the, the YWT raise of, of the lower body. Um, the hinge movement needs to be mastered before we start trying to add uh, reps or, or weight or much challenge to it. Once, once the hinge movement's mastered, we can move into some, some gradual loading. Here I'm just using a kettlebell. You can also use a, a single dumbbell. And we're just trying to create the exact same hinge movement that we just did unloaded, but now with a bit of load for challenge. The Romanian deadlift uh, with the with the barbell is is the next layer up because now we can add a lot more weight with the bar. I find that some rowers who struggle with that connection of of the lats and the torso at the at the catch, especially, um, can also struggle with that in the gym. And by learning how to how to activate the lats and how to keep the whole hinge position tight in the gym, we can really transfer that over well. To, to the water environment. So here I'm just adding a little bit of a mechanical aid of just having to gently squeeze at the armpits to activate the lats through this whole movement. So if, if the bar is really drifting out in front of the athlete, this is one of my go-tos for teaching that, that connection. I show here what happens when we, when we lose connection and the bar drifts forward, we've lost, we've lost the lats there and we've lost our, our little cue. So that could be a helpful one. And I'm, I'm using uh, like knee sleeves there, but you can use a, a clean pair of shoes or, or a hat or really anything there that forces you to just maintain a bit of tension. The kettlebell swing is also a nice one because this can teach that, that cyclical push swing movement that we all know and love. I found this really effective too for teaching, again, tying the shoulder girdle in with the explosive force from the lower body. So let me show it correct one more time here, and then I show it incorrect 
when the athlete lets the shoulder go. So here, here is a lack of connection in our shoulder. And you can see that the bell swings out and forward away from the athlete. So this is not hug the horizon. I'm, I'm actively sort of swinging my body away from it. Uh, so that, that's been a great, a great connection of exercises on land to learning those transferable skills for on water. <clears throat> um, I, I like to elevate the barbell deadlift, especially with the tall rowers. Um, if you're, if you're over six foot two or six foot three, it can be very hard to get down into a good starting position in the deadlift. Um, and it's the only exercise that starts out at that set height, uh, which is due to a totally arbitrary reason that I can tell you about if you're interested. Um, so why, why not elevate it to make it more appropriate for the athlete's height? Here I'm just demonstrating that we can use the same lat key with the barbell deadlift. Um, the barbell deadlift is an exercise that I've used less and less over the years, uh, particularly because I found that rowers have had a really hard time uh, maintaining good physical positions. They tend to just pop the hips up and use the back for it. Um, and, and that's not really doing much to make us better rowers. But I just wanted to demonstrate it here that from a fundamental perspective, if we're training the barbell deadlift to get better at sculling, we need to make sure that we're having the same shoulder and lat connection uh, that, that, that we want in the boat. By far my favorite deadlift uh, has, been, has been the hex bar deadlift. If you have access to this in your, in your equipment, um, being able to use the high handles or the low handles, as well as having the center of gravity more, or the center mass more around the athlete this is also much more in line with the position that we actually want to be in um in the stroke and then for again athletes over six two or six three i use high handles um, or just for athletes who have a hard time getting down to to full range so this is an easy range of motion adjustment and then just again demonstrating that we can do the same lat cue for for, for maintaining tightness Okay, last movement category, and I'm on to some quick programming recommendations and Q&A. Hold on one sec. Rather than just demonstrate the same, the same old uh, planks and everything that everybody's familiar with, I wanted to show you this exercise. It's called the seated rock back, um, and I can talk more about, about where it came from. But the basic idea here is that we're, we're doing the same movement that the torso is going to do around the back end of the rowing stroke. So I'm maintaining good heel connection here. Uh, what usually happens is people will cheat and they'll start to lift from their knees. You can see me sort of struggling with it a little bit, um, and I, I demonstrate it wrong later. But we're trying to keep the heels down the whole time to keep the hip flexors out of the movement and just focus on the anterior trunk muscles or the abdominals. Um, this is another version where you can do it with the hands out in front the same way that we are going to be doing um, on the water. Now we're tying the shoulder function in. Um, and making it a little bit easier too by putting the hands out in front of the athlete. And then I can also do this as an isometric, just at the basic level, is just rock back and hold that position. That could be really challenging with maintaining good heel connection because it just focuses again on the on the abdominals. So here's what happens when we cheat, obviously exaggerated, uh, with with lifting from the heels. I've noticed that the rowers that tend to pull from the from the foot straps or from the shoes on the recovery are also the ones that really struggle with his exercise. And there have been some people who could do a plank for two minutes or something, but we put them in the seated rock back with their heels down and they really, really struggle. So um, that's, that's one exercise that again, I'd recommend that you try. Another is the side plank with row. So here we're getting some hip stability, plus again, tying that shoulder function in with the rest of the movement. I found the side plank to be particularly beneficial and adding this layer of challenge to it uh, as well. And then what I want to demonstrate too was some different one arm carries. You might have more access to these than you typically would uh, if you are doing an outdoor or sort of at home training. Um, here, what we're training is again, hip stability and torso stability around movement at the extremities. So our feet are moving, we're supporting something in our hands. We've got to have the shoulders connected with the torso and stable in the hips. So these are just some different variations that you can play with and see what you learn.
And we don't need to do these real heavy or, or with high amounts of fatigue. We always want to be in good movement positions. Um, I'll, I'll talk in one of my next slides here about sort of how I, how I work this in at the programming level. But these are just some different variations that, that you can work into your training. Band walks are one that I've that I've particularly liked as well. I've got a mini band here around my foot. And here we're training the the rotational hip components. We do not get this in rowing at all. And that's one valuable area for strength training is to build up the muscles and movements that rowing neglects. Because if we're not getting this any other way, then we're setting ourselves up for problems in the long term. Um, by by not developing that element of our of our overall athleticism and and physical capabilities, so these are just a couple of different variations that I'll use. I'm sort of putting my hands on the target area. I want to be feeling this in the in the lateral uh, high hip zone. The gluteus medius, if you like your anatomical terms. And then here's one where we're working the balance in as well. Oh, this one particularly challenging. And the band is maybe a little bit heavy. We have a lighter one that lets some more range of motion happen. That's good. But, but here, both, both hips are working hard to stabilize in this exercise. And there's not much load on the athlete. Let me go back to PowerPoint, get out of the video section. <clears throat> I want to move relatively quickly through the through the programming section. I wanted to spend the bulk of the time um, on on the exercises, the different things that we can do. Just make sure. Oops, okay. So again, the, the, the general goal of strength training for rowing uh, from a performance standpoint is increase strength, decrease our per stroke effort, and improve submax endurance uh, and, and race performance. So our, our general template here is that we're, we're always going to do a warm-up, 10 to 12 minutes of general full body movement, not just jumping straight into our, our working sets for the day. Uh, our main work is going to be typically compound exercises, so more from the squat and hinge uh, categories. And what I'll typically use is about three to eight sets of three to 10 reps, uh, which is inversely proportional. What that means is that if we do, if we're on the three sets side, then we're going to be more on the 10 reps side. And if we're on more of the eights, eight sets side, then we're going to be on more of the three reps side. So that our, uh, hold on, that our, our, we're not doing an insane amount of volume with like eight sets of 10, nor are we doing insanely heavy work with stuff like three sets of three. And so there what we're going for is we're building strength and power in the stroke relevant muscles. The assistance work then, we're building uh, the overall muscular capacity and we're attending to what rowing neglects. So that could be the single, uh, the single limb, the single leg, the single arm exercises, uh, or the full scapular motion exercises, uh, as well as anything from the pressing categories. And then I like to finish with about five to 10 minutes of core uh, moving or carrying, like I showed with those different carries, the band walks, uh, and any mobility work that the athlete wants to add in. I've got core heavily in quotes there because uh, it's clear that we need to broaden out our definition of the core beyond just the six pack rectus abdominis, but where we stop adding things once we start adding things is sort of nebulous. So um, by core, I generally mean the trunk muscles. And then here I've got a couple examples. I'm going to mostly skip over these for right now due to time, um, and and those are in the supplemental materials for you. But these are just a couple program snapshots, uh, not meant to be all encompassing. Just a way to sort of show how the different concepts come together with our our main work exercises uh, as the A's and the B's, and then our assistance exercises with the C's and the D's for higher higher volumes. So um, I've got my email too. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, later on. And then a couple general programming categories. If you row the sprint distance, uh, which in rowing we call 1Ks and 2Ks, but nobody else uh, in any other sport would consider a 1K or a 2K a sprint. Um, 
we need more power than, than we do if we're rowing true distance events. So research indicates that, that a 2K is approximately 77 to 85 percent aerobic. Uh, and then, you know, 15 to 23% anaerobic, but it depends a lot on how fast you are. So it's better to think about distance as duration than it is to think about distance because the research that shows more like 85% aerobic values tends to be done on slower athletes who are doing more like 7.30 or seven minute 2Ks. And then with the more anaerobic athletes tend to be the ones that are faster finishing it in a shorter duration. So energy system is inversely proportional with um, duration and intensity. So the shorter your duration, the higher intensity, the more anaerobic it's going to be. That has direct implications if you're a master's rower racing the 1K distance. Uh, there's no research on that, but in rowing faster, uh, and McNeely says that it might be up to 50 to 60% anaerobic and then only 50 or 40% aerobic. So that really flips the equation. Um, but even that can mean different things. And I, I pulled up from last year's masters nationals, uh, on the left, I've got the men's AA quads who tore down the course in three minutes and seven seconds. Uh, and then over here, I've got the men's K plus, uh, or 85 and up. Uh, single. And you can see that these are very different times. So again, better to think about duration rather than rather than straight distance uh, and, and consider that in your needs analysis for, for what energy system you need to prioritize. And then I'll just briefly mention that you'll get more out of tapering with shorter distance or sh shorter duration racing uh, that, than you will out of longer duration racing just just with the way that energy systems work it's more important to be at full recovery for the shorter more anaerobic distances uh for the for the distance or head racing scholars if we have much higher volume rowing training which we tend to if we're training for a longer race category then we're going to do lower volume strength training so we're going to keep in mind that like we're already getting a lot of endurance work via rowing how many more reps do we need to do uh in order to to really train in the gym at a specific level for like a 6K where we're doing hundreds and hundreds of strokes. So keeping in mind that the higher volume, the rowing training, the, the lower volume, the strength training overall. And there's very minimal anaerobic co contribution um, in, in a distance race. Anything beyond 3KM um, is going to be just so, so primarily aerobic that we really don't need to be doing anything in that middle training zone anyway of like the, the 15 plus reps because it's just training an energy system that's not really used in our racing. And then for my tapering comment there, it's just that we'll get less out of it. So what I tend to do uh, for, for athletes who, who do distance racing is basically just take one day off from strength training the week before the race. So if we train on Monday, we'll take Wednesday off and we'll race on Saturday. And that tends to be enough of a taper for athletes to be able to race full performance. Uh, coastal rowing is a rapidly growing little subsection, um, and so I wanted to mention it here for anybody who does that kind of sculling. Uh, there again, we need to consider the rowing volume versus the strength training volume. Um, I had a coastal client who was training for the 70-48 race, uh, which is 70 miles in 48 hours. Uh, and one of her regular weekend workouts was four hours of continuous rowing uh, or erging. So that's a huge rowing training volume. And there was no room in our strength training volume for any sort of fluff. There could be no wasted effort there uh, because we couldn't get away with it with the amount of rowing volume that, that she was doing. But then coastal rowing means a lot of different things. You can do the, the beach sprints where you've got you know two, 250 meters out and back with a run. Um, and that's a very different uh, physical demand than it is uh, if you're doing the longer distance work. And then the weight of the boat is another thing that, that I learned about um, during this whole process. Um, up to 77 pounds, I think, is, is the minimum for the FISA single for, for coastal. Uh, and that really changes the movement too. So there we need even more more strength because our, the amount that we're having to pull is more when we consider the whole weight of the whole system. So just some quick notes there. Um, that's, that's it from that side of the presentation. I'm happy to take specific questions. We could backtrack to any of those things. I, I didn't come back to questions after the movement section, so sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to lay a couple ground rules down here. Again, no medical questions because um, I'm not that kind of doctor um, or even the other kind. And 
Uh, if you have very in-depth or, or, or personal sort of individual questions, I'm happy to take those by email um, and, and talk more about that with you in, in that format rather than do it in the Q&A here. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, but I can always start again if we need to go back to one of our previous slides. Okay. Um, questions. I have a bunch of questions, which I'm happy to start asking, but I figured I'd check and see first if Troy is still here and wants to announce next week's talk. Or if he's taking a siesta. Yeah, he might not be here. So I can go ahead and announce next week's talk. So um, I just want to get that out there before we derail into too many questions. Uh, next week, same time, Wednesday at four o'clock, we'll have a talk from Steve Welpley, who is the GRP coach here at Craftsbury. That's the Green Racing Project, which is our team of residential high-performance athletes who train year-round with the goal of making the U.S. rowing national team. And he's going to be talking about uh, sculling semantics, subtitled in English majors, deconstruction of rowing terminology. So should be very fun. Um, I hope you'll join us for that. And we'll get that information on the website very shortly after the this talk. So you can check for that. Um, and I'm also going to share a link in the chat in just a moment for the supplemental materials that Will mentioned during his talk. So It'll have his slides, the supplemental PDF, and eventually in a couple of days when we get the video of this recording online, it'll also host the video there. So I'm going to ask Will the first question, and then I will get that link shared into the chat. Okay, so this was a question um, from uh, Ellen, who also coaches here at Craftsbury, um, and she asked about whether you have any advice um, for people who have trouble getting out of the boat because um, they can't stand up when the height of the dock is so close to the height of the seat. Mm -hmm. um, so something other than knee buns or squats that could help them stand up um, if they have that, that issue. Uh, something other than knee bends or squats. That's what she said. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first, hi, Ellen. I'm sorry we're not seeing you in person this year, but uh, hopefully next year. Um, I think the the challenge of avoiding knee bends or squats is that that's basically the movement that you have to do in order to get up off of the dock. So if we're if we're avoiding those movements in training, uh, but then expecting to be able to do them in in rowing training. Um, that, that might just be a, a logistical problem more than anything else. Um, if, if you're avoiding knee bends or squats, uh, for an injury reason, then, then it's possible that reducing the range of motion on squats could help with building up some of that basic strength. So going back to on the front squat, uh, which doesn't have to be done with the barbell, you could just do that body weight, but just starting at the top part of the movement and building up your strength there and then gradually working down in range of motion if you're able to. And she just messaged me. Okay, that's a good answer. So, Thanks, um, okay, so next one was from John Lindbergh early on and he asked, um, if a 2K equals 60% of max watts, what would you estimate uh, is the max watts for a head race or a 5K on the water? Yeah, um, I don't know that I want to get too much into, I think it would be more of a guess than it would an estimation. Um, the 60% figure comes from an Ed McNeely article about peak power. And I, I, I mean, he's had the Rowan Canada thing for a while. So I think that he's collected data to come to that position. Um, although I've not seen the data that that, that, that may be based on. Um, so I, I'm not sure how that would how that would correlate except to say, slightly more for a 1k and slightly less for a for a longer distance um so yeah i'm sorry I, I don't have an exact numerical answer there yeah, that's fair okay so here's a question from sarah asking um if you could elaborate more on why you prefer the front squat to the back squat yeah um one major reason is that is that i started off in rowing uh I, I rode as a junior and then came back into the sport via the weight room um, as, as the strength coach for the men's college team. And I found that I had to sort of foolproof protect a lot of my programming. Um, and with back squats, athletes tended to cheat 
where they would just pop the hips up sort of the same as same problems with a barbell deadlift and put a lot of weight on the back uh, for the sake of being able to lift more weight or more reps. And so rather than constantly having to be the, the, the form police or the no, that's too much weight, no, that's too many reps, um, I found that just changing the exercise really uh, w- was a much more effective switch because it, it basically took that out of my hands and put it into the exercises hands. Uh, the other thing that I like about the front squat is that it loads the athlete anteriorly a little bit more. So there's in the front squat, there's a narrower stance, more upright torso posture. Um, and again, they're supporting the weight through the shoulder muscles, not just resting it there, wider stance, more sit back. So I see the front squat as being overall more similar to the rowing movement. Um, but especially for, I'm, I'm on gallery view now and I can see Quite, quite a lot of masters rowers here. I found that the goblet squat uh, with a dumbbell or, or, or a kettlebell uh, can be extremely effective and that there's no, there's no real reason to go up to the front squat until you're out of challenge with the, with the dumbbell or the, or the kettlebell goblet squats. So same idea, just anterior loading gets the athlete to be a little bit more upright, a little bit more um, force coming from, from the quadriceps as well as tying in the torso and the, and the shoulder coordination with that. Um, question asking, uh, if you could offer some thoughts about using a bungee or other form of resistance as drag work in the boat. Yeah. Uh, a bit of a can of worms because (laughs) I try to clearly differentiate my roles of, of when I'm going to be a strength coach and when I'm going to be a rowing coach. And I've, I consider added load rowing to be the domain of the rowing coach that, that they were trying to improve stroke specific power in the context of a, of a rowing, um, rowing practice or rowing training. I don't think that that's really strength training. And I hear this from athletes too of, Oh, I, I don't do strength training, but I, I crank the resistance all the way up on the erg, um, and, and do sets of 10 strokes. Um, and again, I think that, I think that that's rowing training, and it might be good for your rowing training goals as far as increasing your stroke specific peak power, but it has to be done really carefully. And it's ineffective from a strength training standpoint for a couple of reasons. One is that you're only strengthening the muscles that are already strong from rowing. So if you're not doing other strength training as well, then, then we're missing out on that, on that other side of the equation. And then the other thing is that it misses the, the eccentric component or the lowering component. When you, when you lower yourself in a squat, you're getting all of the all of the hip stability benefits, um, as well as the muscle building benefits of what's called eccentric contractions. And without turning this into a physiology lecture, um, eccentric contractions are where we get more strength and muscle building. Concentric only is what we get in erging, where there's no resistance on the lowering phase, but there is lots of resistance on the on the lifting phase. So that's very effective from a power perspective and for for sports specificity. But again, in strength training, we need to think about what are we doing from a strength training component. So um, I also think that we need to be careful with the added load rowing that we're not doing so much that it interferes with the athlete's technique. So now I'm sort of putting on my rowing coach's hat um, and, and observing that I see a lot of athletes doing added load rowing in a way that interferes with the technique that we actually want them to be doing when they're on the water. So basically, I just think it needs to be done carefully and, and for the right reasons, which is to say a specific rowing outcome. Um, not so much for the for the strength training outcomes. Okay. Um, here's a question about if you, so this person is having trouble not using a little of his lower back, um, mostly when squatting. So he often ends up with a sore back. And he was wondering if you had any more trip, uh, t- tips or tricks to prevent him from using his lower back. Start with the range of motion that you can master. So use, use the bands trick or, or something else that's going to restrict your range of motion without taking any, any load at the bottom or providing any impact at the bottom of the movement. Um, and just build up from the range of motion that you can master. Uh, see if your strength improves from there before you start trying to add range of motion. Um, I, I've been working with a, with a junior rower on exactly this. When she squats down to, to full parallel depth, her hips round under. And then she does put a lot of pressure on her back when she stands back up. Um, that's a common fault. And, and what I found effective is basically just restricting range of motion to where the athlete is able to squat with good technique and then building up from there. 
So see if that see if that works for you. And then single uh, leg work is great too. Sorry, one more one more add on there because then we're really focusing the muscular effort on just one leg, but we're still applying the full force, but without having to add much in the way of external load. So that can also help a lot with either a, a, a reverse lunge or some of those other single leg exercises. Um, so here's a question um, from Steve Hayes asking, um, he, asked, he said you use the phrase pop the hips up when describing your preference for the front squat. And he was wondering if you could explain what you mean by that. Yeah. Um, sorry, I wish that we could be in person. I'd be able to de de demonstrate this for you. But uh, what tends to happen with athletes is uh, I had it in one of my videos of like the rower squat, where from the bottom position, the the hips will just pop up. And then the athlete really uses a lot of back strength in the movement instead of everything rising equally. So if you go back to the squatting video and watch on the goblet squat, how everything goes up and down together, that's that's what we want, not the the other version where the hips rise much faster than the shoulders rise it's probably the best way to describe it okay um <clears throat> so question from ann jane if um if you could ask or if you could explain how long a strength training session should last about on average yeah great question um and, and one that i find that a lot of rowers are surprised by my answer um that really no more than about an hour and when I, when I coached the college team, we had a restriction on us because we only had an hour in the gym. So I had to figure out how to get it done in that amount of time. Um, and that was a really good constraint for me because, again, I didn't have any room for fluff in my program. I had to figure out what's, what's the minimum effective dose for us to get 35 athletes through the gym in an hour uh, plus we, we cheated a little bit because we met outside the gym and we would do a, a, a 10, 10 or 15 minute warm up before we actually started our, our hour in the gym. Um, so up to 75 minutes, including the full body warm up, um, but most often between 45 and 60 minutes. Um, and usually I do two, two full body sessions per week. So just two strength training sessions, which gives us plenty of time and energy uh, and recovery for all the rowing side of training. I find that a lot of rowers are, it, it's just how the sport is where we, we are natural workaholics. Uh, we, we want to do more and more. We want our strength training sessions to exhaust us as much as our rowing training sessions do. Uh, but I found more, more benefit to making sure to leave, leave room in the recovery tank. Um, okay. So here's a question about, um, like hand position during certain lifts. So this person observed that in the dumbbell pulls slash pushes, um, or sorry, he noticed that on the bent over bench row pulls, you had your wrists perpendicular to flat. And he said that he assumed you wanted to keep them in the sculling flat position. So he's wondering if that wrist position matters. Sure. So we, so we might call that uh, pronated or supinated with how, with how we're doing our wrists. If, if again, we're going to be fancy with our anatomical terms. Um, I think that you could do either way. I find that it is often more comfortable for people to be in the underhand sort of motion in order to really feel the shoulder muscles working. If you can do it overhand, what tends to happen, you can watch me do this on, on my screen here is from here to there, the elbows tend to come out a little bit. And that's okay as long as that's not accompanied by the shoulder rising up. So if you can still keep the shoulder down while you go from pronated to supinated, then great. Um, and and I, I will do the row in, in different ways too with drawing the thumbs in versus being in the underhand grip. So I think there's not, there's not a huge difference there, uh, but just the, the primary thing is making sure that we keep the shoulders in a good position during those movements. Um. There's a couple of questions related to just like weight rep schemas. I don't know if you want to get into that. Yeah. Um, yeah. If they're not, if they're too individually specific, we could take those. No, it's just too generally. Yeah. It's two different questions that basically um, just kind of want to talk about, want you to talk about um, heavyweight and low reps versus lightweight and high reps okay, um, sure. preferences. Should you split the week between the two? Uh, so generally I will combine those in the same session. Two, two full body sessions per week. We have our main work exercises of mostly squat and deadlift exercises uh, for lower reps and higher weight. And then we have our assistance work for 
uh, building those muscles and developing the movements that rowing neglects, which we'll do with lower weight and slightly higher reps. Um, so again, we can go back to the programming core concepts slide uh, where I've got sort of my general outline there. <clears throat> and so an example of like our main work would be, you know, we do three, th three sets of five or five sets of five or four sets of eight, something that gets us in that there's our, there's our three to eight sets and our three to 10 reps, which remember we're opposite. Um, and then the assistance work we'll do, we'll do, uh, usually two, two or three exercises, um, try to get unilateral with, with some of those. So one, one arm or one leg at a time. Um, and then typically two to four sets of eight to 15 reps. I don't do a lot of really, really high reps, um, in the gym, because again, we're, we're often getting that from our erging and rowing training. And it's more important that the athlete can use that to main, to develop movement quality and build strength in a way that we can't already get from erging or rowing. Awesome. Um, I have a couple more questions here. It is getting a little past time, so we'll try to wrap it up pretty shortly. Um, but this person was asking if you recommend lifting to failure or stopping before failure. Uh, stopping before, for sure. Um, I, I like to use the rate of perceived exertion scale, which is basically a scale of, of 1 to 10, 10 being uh, maximal effort, no reps left in reserve, uh, failure. Um, and the vast majority of my training is, is with the RPE sort of seven, uh, eight, maybe nine range where we'll at, at RPE nine, we'll go until we have one rep left in reserve. Um, but I don't, I don't think there's a lot of benefit to athletes to be going to total failure, um, because of the, of the movement dysfunctions and the, and the injury risks that tend to come in at, at the total failure point. Um, I also don't. This is one of the things I didn't mention is I, I don't make much use of machines or isolation exercises in my training because rowing is a full body movement in a dynamic, uh, high stability demand environment. Um, and so I don't see a ton of point to, to sitting down and locking yourself into a fixed range of motion. That's a, that, that's an environment where, you know, sort of bodybuilders can go to total failure because the, the injury risks are, are very low on a single joint exercise. But when we're doing full body movements, um, like, like squats and like deadlifts, um, or, or hinge, hinge variations. Uh, we really want to be ingraining good movement mechanics while we're doing that first and foremost, rather than just going to sort of all out, all out stress and failure. Um, okay. Another question about, so this is for somebody who doesn't have access to a gym and heavy weights, um, just small weights and bands at home and wondering what they can do to strengthen their quads. Strengthen the quads. Um, so that so plenty of those single leg exercises require uh, no weight or or very little weight. Um, so I I suspect that there would be something in the single leg squat domain that can that can challenge you um, for 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 doing some higher reps there. That that's a great assistance exercise uh, with the with the low load and the higher reps. Um, so that that would be my recommendation there. Um, and then someone else asked if you could recommend a good source for the bands that you showed. Yeah, I bought mine from a company called Elite FTS, but I know that Rogue Fitness also sells a very durable pair. And uh, what I what I recommend against is sort of buying the cheapest ones that you can at, at a generic online retailer because I find that they just fray fray quickly and then snap when you least expect it. So I've I've had the the pairs in the videos for um, years now. So. Okay, um, okay. I think this will be the last question, um, and it is from Dan asking if you have any advice on strength training to avoid rib or intercostal injuries. Mm, yeah, that's a that that's a longer answer. Um, a lot of it comes down to why the injury is happening in the first place. Rib injuries and in rowing tend to be one of those classic overuse injuries where, where some underlying fault in technique uh, or just athlete, just genetic bad luck, maybe bone, bone density uh, is exacerbated by uh, very high training volume or high load or a rapid progression of load. So I find that 
more than strength training to prevent it is making sure that we're managing the rowing training side to not set ourselves up for, for potential injury. Uh, but from the strength training side, making sure that we can get good force from our lower body is really key to keeping that force off of the rib cage uh, in, in rowing. And what we found, um, what, what, what the research on rib stress injuries shows um, is that athletes who have rib stress injuries tend to have proportionately stronger arms compared to legs. Athletes in this study without rib stress injuries had proportionally stronger legs compared to arms. So there's a little bit of, of a chicken or the egg first sort of thing there. Um, but the basic idea is that if we get more stroke force from the lower body earlier in the stroke cycle, that will reduce some of the stress on the upper body and the rib cage later in the stroke cycle. So I've, I've found it successful to really work on building up the, the lower body, the legs with the, with the squat and the, and the hinge variations, um, as well as making sure that the athlete's shoulders are in good position with all those other shoulder coordination exercises from the, from the pulling section. So it is because the rowing stroke is a cycle, we can't just sort of take one part out or one muscle out, um, much more effective to focus on the whole the whole system and where the force is coming from in the stroke but i have i have a lot more on that and i'd be happy to email with you about about the specifics there okay awesome thanks for answering all these questions and for an yeah. awesome presentation well um i'm just going to send links a few more times here in the chat so i'm sending um will's email address which was also at the end of his presentation um I'm sending my own email address, which uh, you can use if you would like information on future webinars or to be added to our mailing list. Um, I'm also sharing the link, which has, uh, again, which has Will's slides, his supplemental PDF, and we'll eventually have the video of this, rec uh, the recording of this presentation once we get it up in a couple days. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us. Um, Anything to add, Will, to wrap up? No, thanks for thanks for having me. Thanks to Craftsbury for letting me do the the filming in the gym there, um, and and thank you all for joining me this evening. Yeah, um, thank you all for joining us. Okay, we can wave for twenty seconds. I'll give everyone time to get those links down, and then I'll end the meeting. <laughs> of, of YWT raising. Yeah, there we yeah. go. <laughs>